Hello, welcome. Thank you everybody who is joining us today. Um, my name is Haley Peterson Hunley and I am a grant coordinator at Employee and Family Resources. I am a certified prevention specialist specializing in the non-medical use of prescription drug prevention. Um, and today's presentation is going to focus on substance use disorders 101. So we're going to dive into what is a substance use disorder? How do we determine whether an individual has a substance use disorder? How do we um, know what that process looks like and all the different criteria within the middle of that? So we're going to dive right in because there's a lot of content for us to cover today. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat if there's something that I need to repeat or something that maybe didn't come off quite um, understandable, please feel free to type that in the chat and let me know. Uh, we will go ahead and dive right in. So we always start with some disclaimers and disclosures. The content of the presentation is simply for informational purposes. This does not represent any legal or medical advice. I am a certified employee of the Iowa Department of Public Health. Um, with experience in the prevention of substance use disorders. I have no financial or other conflicts of interest, and this training includes drug content. So if that's something that you are a little bit sensitive to, um, please note that there will be pictures and there will be some discussions around uh, substance use disorder and substances themselves. So to dive in, we're gonna talk about why it is important to have these conversations as a group. So it's estimated that 8% of Iowans at age 12 or older have a substance use disorder. Now that is a pretty large subset of our population when we think about adolescents and adults. But then when we look a little bit deeper, even into that specific population, we know out of that 8%, only 10% um, or less were estimated to have received treatment. So we know that we have a significant chunk of individuals who already have a substance use disorder. However, we see a very small amount of those individuals seeking out or receiving treatment. There is a variety of reasons why this happens, one of which can be the stigma associated with receiving treatment or asking for help. Um, other reasons may be the lack of awareness of the different resources or the lack of um, financial resources to be able to seek out substance use disorder treatment. So a quick little quiz, you guys don't have to share, you can just kind of think in your mind, what do you think is Iowa's number one drug problem? So if you had to guess what the state of Iowa struggles with the most, um, think about that. I also would like you to think about the second and the third, so the top three substances in which you think Iowans are struggling with. On this next slide, we are going to look at specifically what our data tells us. So this data comes directly from the Iowa Drug Control Strategy. These numbers are for the year 2019. We're still waiting on data from 2020. So fingers crossed we get that information relatively soon, so we're able to um, pass that information along. So what we know is when an Iowan enters into substance use disorder treatment, they are given a, given a questionnaire. And that questionnaire asks a few questions, one of which is, what is your primary substance of choice? So if you could have any substance, which substance would you choose? And this is where we get these specific numbers. So alcohol is the number one substance misused by Iowans. So when we look at individuals entering into treatment, 43.1% of Iowans who are going into treatment are going in as alcohol um, utilization as their primary substance. Now, when we look at the second one, we know that marijuana is second at 25.6% of Iowans. And then methamphetamine is extremely close at, um, it comes in third at 21.7%. So when we look at this, we know that there are um, there's a big gap between alcohol and marijuana, but there's a significantly smaller gap between marijuana and methamphetamine. So we know that methamphetamine is one of the most commonly misused substances in the state of Iowa, and um, this is something that prevention specialists and treatment workers are working on to try and 
address the situation. Additionally, when we do this training in more of an interactive model, we talk about, uh, we have people guess which substances they think it is, and we commonly hear opioids. And although opioids doesn't make the top three list, opioids are uh, misused in the state of Iowa. When we think about opioids, one of the things that uh, causes it to be at the forefront of individuals' minds is the fact that the consequences associated with opioid misuse and abuse are extremely dangerous. So we know uh, from the year 2019 to the year 2020, the state of Iowa experienced a 20% increase in overdoses, fatal overdoses associated with opioid use disorder. Nationally, there was a 29% increase from 2019 to 2020 in overdoses related to opioid use disorders. So uh, out of all, all of the states, all but two ended up having an increase in o overdoses related to opioids. So we know that although opioids doesn't make the top of the list, we are still struggling with opioid use disorder and working really hard behind the scenes to try and address that to focus on how we can help individuals with opioid use disorder and how we can help to prevent overdoses and fatal overdoses. So the path to addiction, we're going to discuss a little bit of what happens and how we really get to this fork in the road. So this picture right here is really going to serve as our metaphor as we progress forward in our presentation. So when we talk about a lot of this different information, there's a lot of times where there is a stigma associated with what kind of person becomes addicted to a substance. And we want to really call this into play. So we're able to determine what we can do to be able to address these uh, stigmas associated with substance use disorder. So a lot of the times things we're going to hear are going to be one low level of education. So maybe someone who is uh, didn't finish high school, didn't go to college, um, things along those lines. We commonly hear that. Another one that we hear quite frequently is homelessness or poverty. So someone who has a substance use disorder is homeless. Someone who has a substance use disorder lacks financial resources. And then the third thing that we hear most commonly is someone may have emotional problems, mental health disorders, or even an addictive personality. Um, we're going to call all of these into question because what we know is that addiction can happen to anybody. It is not, there's not one subset of the population that can develop it. So if we think about it, if we think about someone who will use, for example, um, didn't graduate high school. So if I know that I didn't graduate high school and that is something that leads to substance use disorder, I may feel doomed that no matter what, I'm going to develop this substance use disorder. And therefore my choices may be higher of risk because of that stigma. What we know is addiction feeds into emotional problems, and then those emotional problems actually cause us to continue moving deeper into the addiction. So um, maybe I am struggling with depression, and so when I'm depressed, I feel like I want to drink alcohol. So then I continue the process of drinking high risk amounts of alcohol, which then feeds into my depression because alcohol itself is a depressant. So as we consume this alcohol, um, it can continue to lead to more emotional problems, which can lead to other problems outside of um, just our emotional problems, which can lead to additional emotional problems. So that's basically a big way of saying, was it the chicken or the egg? And what we know is when someone is suffering with an addiction, um, it commonly leads to an increase in emotional problems. So most commonly, addiction was present prior to the emotional problems. What we know is even people who are happy, emotionally healthy, um, have everything in their life kind of all put together can also develop an addiction. It can happen to absolutely anybody. 
those three characteristics that we talked about that are most commonly associated with that stigma are not more likely to develop a substance use disorder than someone who is emotionally healthy. There is a formula that we're going to discuss that actually can help to determine who will develop a substance use disorder over the life over the period of their lifespan. So what kind of a person? Anyone. Your Life Iowa has really done a great job in partnership with the Iowa Department of Public Health creating a media campaign that focuses on working to help the individual and seeing the individual and not the addiction. So if you are in the um, Polk County, Iowa or the state of Iowa in general, this may be an ad campaign that you have seen or will see in the future. This campaign has been on billboards, Facebook, um, Snapchat ads, all over the place to try and spread this information that substance use disorders can happen to absolutely anybody, regardless of financial history, education levels, or um, poverty types of things. So we know that anyone can develop a substance use disorder, and we need to focus on helping the individual and not focusing specifically on their substance use disorder. So when we think about the development of a substance use disorder, there is a variety of things that come into play when we think about who will develop a substance use disorder and who will not develop a substance use disorder. So we have a formula that is structured based on um, evidence and years and years of research that shows there are things that we can change and then there's things that we can't change. So if we think about the things that we can't change, we think about our biology. So individuals who have family members who suffer from substance use disorders are at an increased risk to develop a substance use disorder. Now, what are the things we can choose to change? Those are going to be our choices. So we're able to determine whether we make high risk choices or low risk choices. And these choices are going to determine whether or not we develop a substance use disorder down the line. So our biology really determines how close we are to that development of a substance use disorder, but our choices are what directs us towards that substance use disorder or keeps us away from said substance use disorder. When we think about the things we cannot change, we need to focus on genetics. So if an individual is born from a birth parent with an addiction, they are four times more likely to develop a substance use disorder themselves than someone who is not. So this research was done in adoption um, scenarios. So they would take children who are born to individuals with a substance use disorder and track them to see whether nature versus nurture really played the biggest role. And what we learned is that having a birth parent with a substance use disorder is a very big indicator of whether or not someone will develop a substance use disorder. However, we know that just because someone is born from a birth parent with an addiction does not mean that they're going to develop an addiction. We have those choices in there. Um, and so that nature versus nurture situation really does come into play here where we may be at an increased risk, but that does not determine that we're going to develop a substance use disorder. Additionally, when we think about the genetic connection between that birth parent having a substance use disorder and the reaction that our body is going to have to substances, there's a lot of very unique things that we would not um, most commonly think about. So if I have a birth parent who has an addiction, I am more likely to have an increased rate of pleasure associated with the substance of choice. So if my parents are, um, if they struggle with an alcohol use disorder, when I use alcohol the first time, I am more likely to have an increase in pleasure over my family member, or excuse me, my friends who maybe do not have a birth parent with an active um, substance use disorder. Additionally, I'm going to have a much lower negative response. When we think about alcohol, there are a variety of negative responses associated with 
alcohol use. And some people experience those negative effects and some people don't. So for example, some of the negative effects may be that flushing, um, feeling overheated, things along those lines are kind of what we call deterrent for people um, when they're using alcohol. So if you're experiencing those negative responses, you're less likely to continue the use of that substance. However, what we know is when an individual has a parent, a birth parent with a substance use disorder, we know that they have a reduced negative response. So they're more likely to have increased pleasure. And then additionally, we note that an individual whose parents have an addiction have a natural tolerance that's going to be higher than someone who does not have parents with an addiction. So our body is born immediately with this genetic update, which um, can then process all of that information. Um, so our body is already preparing for this genetic link between ourselves and our biological parents, which then ultimately can lead to a high natural tolerance. So what does all of this stuff that I've just been kind of spewing out mean? It means that our biology sets our trigger point. So we're going to refer to the point at which we develop a substance use disorder as our trigger point. So our biology will determine how close or how far away we are from the development of that substance use disorder. All of these things that we have discussed above are what determines where we are at in relation to the development. So the next part of this equation that we talk about, we know that our biology sets the trigger point. The next part of this formula is going to be our choices. So we know that choices are not always black and white. We know there are things that are going to influence the choices. So when we think about what we were discussing a little bit earlier, one of the things that can influence our choices is internalizing those pathways. So if I feel like because I maybe don't have my high school education that I'm doomed to develop a substance use disorder, I'm going to internalize that, which can ultimately lead me to make higher risk choices. Because if it's already going to happen to me, why not make these choices? So when an individual internalizes those stigmas and those feelings that of almost hopelessness, that can feed into their choices, which may need, which may lead them to making higher risk choices. Additionally, some other influences on our choices are sensation seeking, impulsiveness, and rebelliousness. So these are all characteristics of someone who um, may make higher risk choices. So if we're sensation seeking, we're probably seeking out all of those different feelings. Impulsiveness, we kind of make decisions um, on the you know blink of an eye, we're making a choice, and then rebelliousness. So all of these can influence us to make high risk choices. These characteristics of an individual are also um, characteristic of someone who is maybe high achieving. So someone who is going to be an entrepreneur, start their own business, uh, maybe the CEO of a company. These themselves do not determine whether or not you're going to make high risk choices. There's lots of other ways that you can um, follow that sensation seeking side of yourself without using substances. Um, other influences may be thinking that that's the route to have fun. So not that the event is the fun, maybe the substance is leading up to that event are fun. Stress and trauma can also be an influence on the choices. So maybe trying to numb out the different stressors that are happening, um, trying to forget the trauma. We also know that if someone is a part of a group that is engaging or encourages high-risk choices, they are more likely to make those high-risk choices themselves. So the groups that we engage ourselves in can be a big influencer on our choices. And how much and how often is more important for when re in relation to why someone is using their substances? it doesn't necessarily matter as much. So if someone is drinking because they are sad, that doesn't necessarily matter as much as how much they're drinking and how often they drink. So we think about individuals, we drink for a variety of reasons. 
So some people drink when they're celebrating, right? We may be going to a wedding, celebrating a birthday. Um, we know some people drink to relax. So maybe um, they've had a long day at work and they want to have a glass of wine. We know that people drink when they're angry and some people also drink when they're sad. And it doesn't necessarily matter why the individual is drinking as much as it matters how often and how much that individual is drinking. So choices determine the progression and the um, regression from our trigger point. So if we're making high risk choices, we're gonna move closer to that trigger point, which again, reminder is where a substance use disorder begins. So overall, we've been developing this formula. So our biology plus our choices will equal our outcome. And the outcome really has two options. We can either develop a substance use disorder or not develop a substance use disorder. So our biology is going to, going to determine how likely we are to develop a substance use disorder, and then our choices will kind of lead the way towards it or away from it. So when we think about the way a brain, our brains work is our brains try to continuously adapt to what is normal within ourselves. So the brain itself changes when someone is misusing a substance and also the brain changes significantly when someone develops a substance use disorder or um, that big scary word of addiction. We actually see that this brain change happens in um, a specific area that can then lead to an individual suffering from this addiction. So when we think about some things associated with a substance use disorder and where we start to see these brain changes happen, we know a couple of things are starting to happen. So tolerance when our brain is trying to adjust to these substances, we're trying to get um, that normal feedback. So tolerance begins to take effect rather quickly, which means it takes more of a substance to get the desired effect um, that we're looking for from that substance. And then dependence is also defined as an increase in tolerance and in withdrawal or discomfort when the drug is removed. So um, dependence can also begin fairly quickly. For a substance such as opioids, dependence can begin very, very soon. Um, and so when that substance is taken away, we may experience discomfort, which is associated with those brain changes that we were discussing. So tolerance and dependence are both indicators that our brain is changing to adjust to the substance that we are using. Additionally, when we think about the difference between substance usage and a substance use disorder, there is a big change that happens within the brain, and this is where we see addiction. So addiction is defined as a physical dependence plus a psychological component of compulsive use, even if the individual is facing different challenges or problems associated with it. So when we think about the overall use of opioids in this characteristic, we're going to see a variety of things that take place. So we start over on the left-hand side of the screen and someone is using an opiate. So this starts at opiate use. Um, we're going to say that this individual is not using it as prescribed. So we're seeing this individual use it more often than was intended outside of the medical purposes or, um, a higher dosage. So what happens is as they're using and misusing the substance, they begin to develop an opioid, opiate dependence. So they begin to have the feeling that if they don't use that substance, they're in discomfort, um, that tolerance is increasing, which then leads us into this disorder characteristic. So we have this little oval right there, and that's where we've really moved into what is characterized by um, the disordered use of, in this case, opiates. So some of the things we see that begin to happen are social problems. So maybe struggling with um, familial relationships, friendships. Um, we start to potentially see issues within our work. So maybe we're late to work. We aren't as productive as we normally are. All of these things feed into that social problem. Um, we may even see 
crimes being committed, prison or jail time taking place as well. And then also within this disordered use, we see that there are issues associated with the brain. So we see that there are thinking problems, we may experience a craving, and then also this begins to become one of the most important things in our life. So this substance then becomes more important to us than our family members, our friends, our career. And all of this ultimately continues to lead us into using more and continues to increase that tolerance and that dependence, which ultimately leads to that brain change, which is where addiction lives. So when we think about opioid use disorders, substance use disorders in general, there's going to be a variety of stepping stones to get to where someone has a substance use disorder. Initially, we have the green phase. So the green phase is characteristic of low risk choices. If we're making low risk choices, there's no chance of us progressing and uh, developing a substance use disorder. So some things that are characteristic of our low of our green phase are quantity and frequency. We're using in low risk amounts. So if we're not using or following the low risk guidelines there, um, we have no chance of progressing to the trigger point. Our age is a big determinant. So at what age someone is beginning to use plays a big role in the development of whether or not someone will develop a substance use disorder. Um, and so those are important to keep in mind too. If someone is using below when they're younger than 21, um, that can be an indication that they're probably making higher risk choices. And then we want to make sure we note that low risk is going to be different for every single individual. So low risk is not going to be the same for me as it would be for other family members or friends. So some things that kind of come into play there are going to be biological factors. So if we have family members who have substance use disorders, um, if we have health problems, so um, there are certain health related conditions in which it is not um, low risk to drink in general. So certain medication use can um, lead to that. And then there's other reasons in which it would not be considered low risk to use. So for example, if a woman is pregnant, it's not considered low risk for them um, to drink, even if they're following those standard low risk guidelines. Now, after we move out of the green phase, we are now in the area where we are characteristic of high risk choices. The first area that we develop into is the yellow phase. So yellow phase is really where we're starting to see that initiation of those high risk choices, which show that we're progressing towards that trigger point. So what we know is once we're in the yellow phase, people are using outside of the 0123 guidelines for alcohol usage and the use of illegal substances is automatically placed in the yellow phase. We know that there is an increase in reward and pleasure responses associated with these high risk choices. So my high risk choices are making me happy, making me feel good. So I'm going to continue to use these substances because this is how I am getting that positivity within myself. We also know that at this point, we have an increase in tolerance and tolerance begins to increase rather quickly as we progress through the phases. We may begin to experience memory problems. In the green phase, we had an attitude of we could have this substance or we could not have this sub substance and it really wouldn't make a difference to us. However, when we're in the yellow phase and making these higher risk choices, we are anticipating the use of these substances. So um, I'm looking forward to Friday night where I get to have, you know, the alcohol outside of the low risk guidelines. Um, some of the other things associated with this phase is social dependence. So I'm probably joining groups that are encouraging my high risk choices. So we're just having fun. It's a part of what we do. Um, and that's really where we start to see these groups that become dependent on substances. One of the most beautiful things about the yellow phase is we can, at this point, with very low effort, return to the green phase. So once we start making low risk choices, we can easily progress back to the green phase. 
Now, as we continue, if we continue to make high risk choices, we move into the orange phase. The orange phase is where we begin to see that psychological dependence. Now, psychological dependence itself doesn't necessarily mean something bad. We are probably all psychologically dependent on something. So, for example, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your job, um, your family members. There may be all of these different things that we are dependent on psychologically. If we didn't have that, it would make us sad and uncomfortable. However, when we have this psychological dependence to a substance, we know that this can create an extremely scary cycle where our dependence is leading us to make high risk choices. And our high risk choices are then leading us to uh, having that increased psychological dependence. Uh, what we know in the orange phase is high risk choices become more important than the other things in our life. What we note is when we progress through these phases, we're bringing all along with us all of the things that we've had in the previous phases. So everything that we experienced in the yellow phase, if we move to the orange phase, we're going to bring that with us. Um, at this point, we begin to develop a sense of relationship with our substance of choice. So I may be known as being the person who has the best stock of craft breweries. I may be known as um, the person who is an expert on the substance. So it really becomes incorporated into our identity and we are now relying on that substance to feel comfortable. Um, we are not going to enjoy the event if the substance isn't there. So that substance is the fun versus the other event. Now, again, in the orange phase, we can also move back to the green phase. We're able to make those low risk choices to move back to the green phase. When that happens, we leave all of this baggage there in the orange phase and we progress back ourselves. However, um, if we continue to make these high risk choices, the psychological dependence continues to progress and we start to see all of these things happen. So one of the most important and predictive things of the orange phase is we move from that anticipation to preoccupation. So our body goes from looking forward to the substance to now I am, the substance is the fun for me. Our brain begins to change and we begin to adapt to this. Um, and we, again, very similar to the yellow phase, we start to have a brain change that is related to stress and reward. So we're starting to experience more stress and less reward. And so the choices to make, high risk choices become extremely automatic. I'm sad, I'm going to drink. I'm happy, I'm going to drink. I had a rough day, I'm going to drink. And ultimately, this creates that cycle that leads um, to impaired executive function. So we're unable to make the best choices for ourselves. And this is really where we are at a critical point. Our critical point determines whether we return to the low risk phases or we progress into the red phase, which is where addiction lives. So addiction is where we have reached our trigger point. So we've moved through these phases. And if at the orange phase, we continue to make those high risk choices, we will progress to the red phase, which is where addiction lives. So we've moved from anticipation to preoccupation, and now we're living in a compulsion state. So we feel compelled to use the substance. We know that within the red phase, we see a periodic loss of control associated with substance uses, usage. Um, we also note that withdrawal is associated with the red phase, and there's changes to the tolerance level, which can be extremely tricky for someone experiencing it. Overall, um, this was a very broad and overview look at substance use disorders. But one of the main things to take away from this is recovery is possible. We know there are many people in our communities who have success stories. How do we get someone into recovery? We have to work together to destigmatize what substance use disorder looks like and note that it is a health disorder versus a choice that um, can be made. We know that um, relapse can be a part of the recovery process. And one of the most effective ways 
for recovery is medication assisted treatment. Additionally, harm reduction is possible. So we talked about noting the fact that we want to reduce fatal overdoses. We want to reduce overdoses in general. How do we do this? Well, we increase access to medical care. Uh, we make sure people are using in safe manners. Narcan is an extremely powerful harm reduction tool that we can use in our communities. Narcan is the overdose um, is an overdose antidote for opioids. Um, and then working to give individuals who may still be using dignity. So how do we do that? We reduce those stigmas. If you want more information on any of these things and on resources in your own area, Your Life Iowa has access to all of the different things um, that you may need. So there's a tab for anything you may need related to prevention, treatment, and mental health. So I think, Johanna, oh, this is where you're going to happen. Yeah. Perfect. This was such great information, Haley. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a podcast at EFR. It's called Emotion Well. You can find us in the Apple Podcast Player, Google Podcast Player, Spotify. You can also go to our app, or we actually have our own web, uh, excuse me, our website, or we have our own app now where you can listen to Emotion Well. But we have a variety of uh, episodes. Haley was actually a guest on one of them, so you'll have to go back to the archives and, and check that out. But yeah, please listen to our podcast. We cover a variety of topics related to emotional well-being. And on the next slide, I wanted to remind everyone, or maybe this isn't a reminder, it could be the first time you're hearing that we have an app. It is available in the Apple App Store and on Google Play search EFR, and it may not be the first thing that comes up, it might be the second or third su suggestion, but this app is going to allow you to chat online with one of our phone counselors. You can, again, listen to our podcast, register for webinars, watch past webinars, and of course, stay up to date with our blog. And then lastly, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that if you're listening and you have benefits with employee and family resources, don't hesitate to call us at 800-327-4692. We are available to answer your questions, set you up with EAP services, whether it's counseling, um, legal consultation, financial consultation, or just wanting to talk through something, we are here for you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Haley today? She graciously uh, included her personal contact information here. As you can see, there's an email and a phone number. And, so we know that a lot of times people don't have questions that they want to ask publicly about this topic, but if you have a question um, that you are comfortable asking, please include it in the chat. And if you're not comfortable asking it uh, today, please take Haley's contact information down and reach out to her directly. <clears throat> I just, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to make a personal plug. Um, so my life has been affected by alcoholism. I have alcoholism in my family and um, I have important people in my life who are uh, living with alcoholism and I just want to let the listeners know that uh, Al-Anon has been a tremendously helpful support group for me and so um, for a long time I just kind of lived with a lot of the same characteristics of the alcoholic, um, isolating, kind of um, avoiding the situation, um, enabling and it is really difficult and so it's difficult for the person living with the addiction but it's also really difficult for the the people that maybe live with them um, work with them are in relationships with them and so if you are feeling kind of like you don't have a support system of course I would recommend you call EFR but also there are support groups and I just personally um, wanted to let you all know that I, I have found al to be tremendously helpful for me uh, the, Vicki just asked, will this presentation be available for future viewing? And yes, we will be putting it on our website. So, <laughs> excuse me, it should be up later today, Vicki. And so, yes, please share this with um, anyone that you think might benefit. It's a lot of great information and it's kind of a crash course because I'm sure Haley could speak to this topic for a long time. And um, to ask her to condense it all into 30 minutes was probably a challenge. So thank you, Haley, for doing that. 
Well, I'm going to let everyone go. I just wanted to make um, an announcement about our upcoming webinar. We have our next webinar in October. And let me just pull that information up here. Our facilitator is going to be Lars Peterson. And he is going to be talking about uh, cutting through the clutter to get more out of your life. And so it's going to be focused on kind of finding meaning and purpose. And, um, you know, there's this whole idea that time management is the key to, you know, always kind of being in that better place. But Lars is going to help you cut through the clutter and maybe you can trim some of that stuff out of your life. So that is Wednesday, October 13th at 10 a.m. And if you go to our website at the top under the resources menu, you can click on webinars, view past web webinars, and sign up for future webinars. But thank you so much, Haley, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, appreciate your time and attention and make it a great day. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.